For those of you who do not know me, my name is John, and I'm one of the student ministers here at Grace Point. And so I have been given the privilege to be able to bring the word to you guys. And so when I, actually, before I pray for us, I just want to get you guys to turn to your bulletins, to your outlines, and you'll be able to see the roadmap of where we're going to be going in our passage this morning. And so when I pray for us that the Lord will open our hearts and our minds as we receive what he has to say to us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you once again that we get to meet like this where we can come and be fed by your word. And Father, we just want to pray that you'll humble us, help us to be receptive to what you have to say to us, help us to be challenged and to be confronted, but also to be comforted by what you have to say. And so, Father, we commit all these things in your Son's precious name. Amen. Ministry is hard. Let's put it out there. Ministry is difficult, painfully difficult. We've been living through various challenges in ministry through this interesting season that we're in. And for those of you who are visiting us at the moment, maybe this is your first time, you probably don't know what the word ministry means. And so let me explain. Among Christians, ministry is the duty and responsibility to bring the gospel to bear on the lives of people, right? It is bringing the teaching of God's word to bear on the lives of people. And so that actually means a whole bunch of things, really. Christians can serve in all kinds of ministry, whether they're in some, some, some form of formal leadership or not. And lots of us here have encountered great difficulties as we've been serving others within our areas of influence, whether it was at church or whether it's in the family or in the workplace. We've had people who've exited our ministries and our one-to-one meetups because they say they're no longer growing and they no longer want to be part of this community. Right? We've also perhaps have tried to read our Bibles with our children, but because our lives have been so, so busy and constantly disrupted by distraction and busyness, we've not been able to tend to that. Some of us here have tried evangelizing and sharing the gospel with family and friends. And we've tried to live faithful lives and to be a good witness to our family in the home, but to no avail oftentimes. Instead, we've often seen great opposition from our family and we've experienced sorrow and grief over the unrepentance. And all of this is happening all the while we are managing all the other stresses in our life in the home and at work, and all these things actually have this compounding effect that makes us feel absolutely drained and exhausted. When we are called to bring the message of Jesus to bear on the lives of people, and and that's basically what ministry is, right? When we do so, we are bound to face disappointment and despondency. It's a joy to serve in ministry, right? Don't get me wrong, ministry is fun. But ministry is also hard and difficult, right? Painfully difficult for many of us. We make decisions that people aren't always happy with. We, we have people who resent us. We're susceptible to being misunderstood. And ministry can often feel lonely and at times overwhelming. And so for lots of us here sitting in this room right now, the new year of ministry only brings back painful memories of the past. And so if you've been in ministry for long enough, whether you've been serving in a formal position or not, you will one day be discouraged. It's inevitable. Ministry often reminds us of how broken we really are. And so how do we actually persevere in serving? That's the question, right? How do we persevere in serving, especially when ministry just seems so hard? The Apostle Paul has shared his many moments in ministry where he was on the edge of despair. He's encountered many challenges over the course of his lifetime as he gave himself to lifelong service to the Lord. And he has one central message for us this morning. To not lose heart, for our brokenness is not a liability in the service of the Lord, it's an asset to be treasured. I'll say that again. Paul says to us that we are to not lose heart In serving our Lord Jesus, for our brokenness is not a liability, it's an asset to be treasured. Now, how is Paul able to say all this, right? Well, we're actually going to discover 
what he means in just a bit as he gives us three big encouragements for us in our passage today as we continue to serve God and his people this year. We should not lose heart in ministry because firstly, God uses us powerfully in our imperfection. Secondly, God gives us strength through Christ's resurrection. And then thirdly, God renews us day by day until our glorification. You can see those points right there down in your outlines right there. And so we're going to go through each of them, right? Come with me to our first point in verses 7 to 9. Verses 7 to 9. Now, what is this treasure that we see here in verse 7, right? Have a look at verse 6, the verse before it. And what we find is that the treasure here is the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. So basically, the treasure here is clearly the gospel. The gospel containing the glory of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And throughout the chapters and verses we've been studying over the last few weeks, we examine that Paul says we've been given the ministry of the new covenant, right? That we've been given this task of preaching the gospel. We preach Christ alone, not of ourselves. And as we preach the gospel, we see the transformative power of the gospel impacting the lives of those who hear the message of Jesus. Power does not come from us but power that comes from God himself. Only God can change people from within. Because, Paul says, we're merely jars of clay. That's what he says there, right? Now, when Paul refers to himself, and he refers to us here as well as jars of clay, what is he trying to demonstrate? Well, I think he's actually trying to illustrate something very powerful here, right? In the ancient world, Clay jars were containers that were used in everyday living for cooking, for eating, for drinking, and for storing leftovers, right? And in every household, you'll find these jars. You'll find them in every household. And they weren't the most glamorous looking pieces of decor in the room, but they certainly were very useful. But when they broke, they would be disposed rather quickly. They were dispensable and disposable. They were cheap and easily replaceable. And today we have our Monday equivalent, don't we? That serve the same sort of purposes that we have in our everyday living today. Think of plastic bags, for example. Okay? I'm willing to bet that every single one of you here has a plastic bag lying around in your house somewhere. And that plastic bag has many uses, doesn't it? We use them to carry things around. We carry our groceries with it. We carry our goods. We also use it to collect our dog's poop. And of course we use it to line up our rubbish bins as well. We all use plastic bags. And I'm willing to bet you guys that if I could think of a nation in the world that has been the most happiest about the invention of plastic bags, it would be Asians like you and me, okay? Every Asian household has a whole stack of them, right? We keep and retain every single plastic bag that we can get from every shopping trip that we go on. True? It's the most Asian thing you could ever possibly do. And for those of you guys who care lots about the environment, you know, I just want to say this, that if you ever see a turtle choking on a plastic bag, you should never blame me or anyone else in this room because we store all of our plastic bags underneath our kitchen sinks, don't we? Plastic bags are so reusable and they're so useful, aren't they? But as soon as you rip a hole in them, They're rendered completely useless, and we'll discard them immediately. And then we just get another one to replace it, right? These bags are just so useful, but they're also so disposable as well, aren't they? They're cheap, and they're easily replaceable. And to be frank, Paul is actually describing himself, and he's describing us just as that. We're jars of clay that are frail and weak and mortal, We're fragile and we're easily replaceable. And that is exactly the reason why the Lord intended to use us, right? The precious treasure of the gospel is to be stored in jars of clay in broken vessels like us. Have a look at verse 7 there. Have a look. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The power 
of God is to be displayed in the weakness of Paul. And the reason for why God would use fragile and weak humans like us for the ministry of the gospel is so that there is no chance, no chance at all, that anyone would ever assume that the conversion of souls would rely on human capacity. Not a chance. Because we're never powerful to begin with. The only reason why we're able to do what we're capable of doing is all by the power of God. Have a look at verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. You see, we see in Paul's ministry, he's gone through so much pain and so much hardship, more than any one of us have ever experienced in our lives so far. Right? Firstly, the man was hard-pressed, as we see there in the verses. He was hard-pressed. He was afflicted. He was squeezed under the immense pressure and stresses of faithful gospel ministry. But he was not crushed. And then we also see, secondly there, the man was perplexed. Now, what was Paul perplexed about? Well, you know that Paul has experienced so many confusing moments in his time in gospel service to the Lord, right? Just imagine what would have been like for the Apostle Paul. Because the guy had had to deal with some of the toughest pastoral situations and some of the weirdest pastoral issues that anyone has ever had to handle, right? Just, just think with me for a moment. Imagine this, right? Imagine if your leaders and your pastors have had to catch up with one of you all here for out for coffee to talk about a serious moral issue because they've been made aware that one of you has slept with your own mother, okay? And what's worse is that the rest of you here all think that for some reason it is okay for that man to be doing that sort of thing. Now, that situation sounds pretty weird, but we actually find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, right? And here's another one, right? Imagine uh, Elliot's not here, right? So I can, I can talk about him. But Elliot, imagine that Elliot goes on an eight-month paternity leave from his pastoral duties because Cheryl and he are about to have a baby, if you guys didn't know. And, and that's pretty cool, right? They're going to have their first child soon. And so he's going to go on leave. But then when, uh, when he comes back finally after eight months, he finally comes back. And to his surprise, all of you here are like, Sorry, but who are you, right? Are you even our pastor? Like, we don't really recognize you anymore. And also, we want to let you know that your preaching sucks, okay? Your leadership is weak source. And we actually managed to find someone who's way better at the job than you are because we've got Clem Huey, who's our apprentice right there, okay? He's going to lead us, okay? Now, that sounds pretty bizarre, right? But that's actually what we're going to see later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and then here's the last one, right? In, imagine this, right? That, that we plant a new campus, and let's call that Granville. And at first, things are looking fine, right? Things are running, things are uh, going. Until at some point, someone within the campus leadership team thought it was necessary to change what's written in the membership essentials document and specify that circumcision is necessary for salvation. Imagine that. And in order to be a communicant member of this church, the document says you've got to snip it off. Now imagine that, right? That someone would say that if you don't have the snips, then you can't join the mix. <laughs> Again, it sounds ridiculous. But that is actually what happened. Well, not, not in this church anyway, but it, what, it happened in the church of Galatia in Galatians chapter 3. See, all of these moments I've just talked about here, they're all perplexing, aren't they? And yet these are the things that the Apostle Paul experienced. Sounds kind of weird, kind of funny, but it's all true. And I'm sure that for you leaders right here, these cases aren't too far off from reality, aren't they? Because many of you have experienced these things. And personally for me and for others, I reckon Paul also would have had moments upon reflection where he probably just asked himself like, Good grief, like, what did I do wrong here? And how did I fail these people? Um, could things have turned out differently if only I did things a little differently? If I said or did this thing instead, would we have been able to avoid this situation altogether? You know, the what ifs always gets us pondering, doesn't it? And Paul would have felt weak in these moments. 
And Paul was perplexed at these situations in ministry. He, he would have felt powerless at times to just figure out what was he meant to do in those pastoral situations. But you know what? He didn't fall into despair from his own incompetence and weakness. And that's what we find. And then thirdly, we also see that Paul was persecuted, right? Preaching the gospel did not make you popular back then, right? He was probably chased out from every single town that he's ever went in. And, you know, I'm willing to bet that whenever the apostle actually went to a new town to share the gospel, he probably never bothered to ask the locals where the closest inn was or where the closest Airbnb was to stay because he, he probably knew that he was going to stay the night in the local jail anyway. Persecution comes when God's people live in true obedience to him. Right? The Christian faith was, is, and continues to be a persecuted faith. And so there was a bounty on his head wherever he went. But even during those times, he says... He was never forsaken. He never truly felt alone. He was never abandoned, he felt. And then lastly, Paul was struck down. We see that right there. And on many occasions, he nearly died, right? And we see that in Acts chapter 14, if you guys have read that particular chapter, of the particular incident that Paul was in, where he was hunted down by his former friends, and he was ceremonially stoned to death. And his body was just dragged outside the city to rot under the sun. The guy was basically led for dead. But somehow, Paul was able to just get up on his two feet. And then he went back to the same town that he nearly died in. Paul was struck down, but he was not destroyed. And his recounting of these experiences should never cease to amaze us as we think about it. And you know what I find really perplexing about this, and maybe you do too, is this, like, how does a man go through all that? How does a man go through all that and not crumble? How does a man live on the edge of death and not feel crushed by the burden, not driven to despair, not feeling forsaken and not destroyed? How does he persevere? It's only by the power of God. It's only by the power of God. Only by the power of God was he able to endure and persevere through the toughest of challenges. And Paul never felt crushed by the overwhelming burden of ministry. Why? Because God strengthened him by his sufficient power. Paul was never driven to despair because he trusted in the sovereign power of God to work all things for good. And Paul never felt forsaken because God and the power of his comfort was always on his side. And Paul was never struck down, but Paul was struck down, but not destroyed because he trusted in the one who has the power to raise the dead. You see, the Lord has continued to sustain him that entire time. Now, while most of these problems came from the fact that he was called as an apostle and and for all of us here, we weren't called to serve in the particular way that Paul had to serve when he was living during that time. But I think many of us can recognize and even empathize with how Paul felt. We can share our difficulties, right, with the apostle here himself about ministry. And yet, despite experiencing every temptation to be crushed, to fall into despair, to feel forsaken, the Lord had empowered him throughout his difficulties here. And that is what God is able to do and accomplish in broken jars of clay like us. That our weakness is not a liability to God. In fact, our weakness is an asset to be treasured and to be used for the service of the Lord. Okay. Now, a number of you guys might be aware that that I attend two services here, right? I I attend morning here, but I also attend the 4 p.m. service in the afternoon. And in the 4 p.m. service, we have a member there who's a very tall, handsome Korean dude, right? And he's very godly as well. For those of you who do attend 4 p.m., you guys know what I'm talking about. And whenever I look at that man, and then I look at myself, it's, I'm always led to believe that not all men are made equal, okay? And I'm convinced that God really does spend more time on some people than he does with others. Now, jokes aside, 
I think one of the great dangers that we fall into is falling into the same sort of thinking, especially when it comes to ministry. That we think we are needed and indispensable people. That we think we're more gifted and more capable of serving than the rest. And that the ministries we're doing for this church either stands or falls on our shoulders. Our clay jar, for example, might look prettier and more aesthetically pleasing and more glamorous than the rest of these other jars here, okay? We might look more impressive than other people. We ooze out confidence and people find us appealing. And maybe our jar has greater capacity and contain more water than the rest of us here. Maybe you're someone who's capable of doing more and serving more than the rest of your peers here. But even though you might look more impressive than the rest, maybe even though you are more capable of serving than other people here, if you have this idea that you are needed and indispensable, then I think you're seeing yourself a little bit too highly there. Because just remember, you might be the nicest looking and the biggest looking piece of ceramic here in this room, but at the end of the day, you're still just a piece of ceramic. And I'm not saying that to be mean, because that's what scripture is saying. You can easily shatter and break. And Paul knew of this of himself, right? That he saw himself as a jar that was given the utter privilege of carrying the precious treasure of the gospel. Human weakness is not a barrier towards achieving the great purposes of God. Our weakness is not a liability. Instead, it's an asset to be treasured. And when we're nicely polished jars, we actually give reason for people to take notice of us rather than taking notice of the treasure of the gospel that is hidden within us. So treasure your weakness because the Lord intends to use it. And why does God insist on choosing and using broken people like the apostle here to put his light and glory? Well, here's another reason why, right? It is because through our brokenness and weakness that the life of Jesus Christ can be shown. We're at our second point. Have a look there. Have a look at verse 10. Verse 10, Paul says in verse 10 that we always carry around on our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus might also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. You see, Paul was speaking about the physical and the emotional pain that accompanied his ministry. And isn't that actually the great principle of ministry? That Christ died so that we might live? That is actually just, that is the essence of Christian ministry right there. When we observe the life of Paul as an apostle, you, you can actually see the trail marks of adversity wherever he went. Right? He suffered tremendously over the course of his life. And that is, this is actually key to understanding the place of suffering in the Christian life. Because the question we need to ask ourselves is, like, how are we to display the life of Jesus most clearly in the world? How are we going to show Jesus most clearly to this world? And if we're going to be used valiantly for the ministry and for the growth of God's people here and for the, for the spread of the gospel out into God's world, then we need to embrace death. We need to embrace death. And embracing death means putting death to self so that we can exemplify the beauty of the life of Christ into the world. Putting to death means putting to death our sinful desires, means putting to death our our greatest earthly treasures. Putting ourselves to death means living our entire lives for God's agenda, for God's purposes. And folks, this is costly, isn't it? That all kingdom-focused ministry is costly. Because as we see in this passage, you know, without Paul's dying to himself, there would be no life in the Corinthians. Jesus died on the cross so that others might live. The principle of the cross is the same principle for ministry. And that is what it means to carry around the death of Jesus in our bodies. And you know, this calling is very difficult for many of us here. Because let's be honest here. 
rather than carrying the death of Jesus, many of us here are carrying the life of our material treasures instead in our bodies. If you're someone here who loves material things, if your clay jar is filled with all the treasures in the world, do you know what you're doing? You're submerging the radiating light of the gospel that's within you. And I'm not saying, right, I'm not saying that it is wrong to have nice things, right? You can be a Christian and have nice things. But if living luxuriously and living the high life is all that you live for, then no one's actually going to be impressed about your Christian faith. If your life screams the motto of that life should be filled with health and wealth, the world is not going to be impressed. And the world is not going to care about what you have to say about Christianity and what Jesus has to offer. Because what's the incentive? You're just like everybody else. You think and feel the same way they do. If you insist on saying that Jesus is precious to you, when everything else that you possess is just as precious, then no one's going to take you seriously. With all the possessions and treasures that are trampling over the, the glorious treasure of the gospel that God has stored in you, you choke your own potential to radiate the light of the glory of the gospel. What screams real attention to our world is that we embrace death. And you know, perhaps this might mean for some of us that we got to clear out that space in our clay jars, that we forfeit our possessions and our belongings, our treasures and our trophies. We got to clear it out so that the glory of the gospel can illuminate brightly out of us. And so that's a question to think about, right? If someone were to peer through and see what's inside your jar, what would they see? What would they find? Would they see the radiant light of the gospel shining through the cracks? Or would they see the clusters of earthly treasures and possessions and idols sitting on top of the gospel? Things that you hold dear. Every opportunity to suffer for the Lord Jesus is an opportunity to display his resurrected life. So embrace death, everybody. Embrace death for the sake of others in our world so that those outside the kingdom will know the love of Jesus. And you know, Paul was actually able to embrace his lifestyle. It's a difficult lifestyle, but he was able to embrace it. And we see that in verses 13 and 14, right? He was able to embrace death to self and death to his entire life because he was confident, as you see there, in the one who could raise him from the dead. Verses 13 and 14. You see it right there. I'm going to read it for us. He says, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Therefore we have the same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. And you see that? This verse here lies the place of Paul's utter confidence, the resurrection. And here lies our second encouragement in the passage today. He speaks the gospel, Paul. He proclaims the gospel. And he does all of that in the face of adversity. And Paul doesn't lose heart because he knows he's going to be okay. You know, the only thing that could have stopped Paul in his tracks from serving other people and serving and preaching the gospel The only thing that could have really, really stopped him was death itself. And we already talked about the account of Paul's near-death experience in Acts 14, right? Remember? Where he was stoned and he was left for dead as his enemies dragged his mangled body to the outskirts of of the city. But then he just miraculously got up and he just went back to that same city to evangelize and preach the gospel. You know, if we just think for a moment, how on earth was he able to get up from all that? And by the way, if, if you guys didn't know, I just want to let you know of this, right? That you don't just walk away from ritual stoning with, with little scratches, right? Because your skin would bruise, your organs would bleed, your bones would break, and the pain is great. How would you just get up like that? How was Paul able to get up on his two feet other than the power of the living God? the one who is able to raise the dead back to life. This confident hope in the resurrection is actually what gave the apostle Paul the strength he needed to 
could persevere in ministry. It was because his future was secured in Christ that he was willing to carry in his body the dying of Jesus. It was because he trusts that God will raise him from the dead that he is able to give his entire life for the gospel and for others. He speaks and proclaims the life of Jesus onto others, even at the cost of his life, because the resurrection of Christ frees him to speak boldly of Christ. Christ's giving of himself to us enables us to give our all to those who are perishing. It enables us to give our all to the people whom God has given to us to love and care for. And that is actually why Paul is able to say there in verse 15, if you have a look, that all this is for your benefit. All this is for your benefit. He's speaking to the Corinthians there. Not my benefit, but your benefit. Because Christ has given all of his spiritual benefits to me already. That's what Paul's saying. And guys, isn't this the hope that we all need in ministry? Don't we? I wonder whether we've personally understood the significance of the resurrection for ourselves, right? We might affirm the resurrection intellectually, right? Sure. We might affirm it in our minds, but have we really, really grasped the resurrection in all of its realness? We subscribe to the truth of the future resurrection in principle, but in reality, I think for lots of us here, the resurrection is an airy fairy tale that brings no relevance to our lives. How exactly? What do, you, what do I mean by that? Well, I think many Christians have adopted this whole idea of self-preservation in ministry. Okay? There's this whole attitude that has shaped the minds of believers today where people think it is okay to serve others and be involved in ministry so long as it suits my preferences. Did you know that under this sort of thinking, it is actually possible to give to others without actually giving yourself to others? You see the careful nuance there? It's possible to give to others without giving yourself to others. What I mean is, those who think like this think that I can serve and minister to others so long as I can maintain my work-life balance, right? so long as ministry doesn't intrude on all the other things I want to do in my life, so long as I don't have to give substantial amounts of my money away, so long as it doesn't give me trouble, so long as I can pick and choose what I serve in and where I serve in and who I serve under, so long as I don't have to expose myself to hardship, to pain and to burnout. Now, don't get me wrong, right? Because I totally get it. I totally get why people are so attracted to this, right? Because what's not to love about this way of life, right? We, we, we can serve and we can play our role at church. We can live comfortably at the same time, right? We can set boundaries on our commitments. We can choose what we want to serve in and what we don't want to serve in. And we can choose to hand off hard things that we don't want to do to others. And we also don't have to take responsibility. All the while we can give people the illusion that this is Christian faithfulness. What's not to love about this? This is a way to maintain our longevity in life and ministry, isn't it? Right? Self-preservation self is attractive, isn't it? Because that's in our human condition. That's in our human condition and our human instinct to protect ourselves from danger. That our nature and our condition to, to shield ourselves from harm's way. We all get it, don't we? That's why self-preservation is so natural for us. And before you guys go off and assume that I, I'm really bashing on this sort of idea, I just want to affirm some things about it, right? Because I, 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 I want to say that I'm not saying that you should recklessly and thoughtlessly run into the firing line, right? Don't even say that. I'm, I'm not saying you should give every single cent that you ever earn to the ministry. I, I'm not saying that. I'm also not saying you should pour all your time into serving in every single ministry you possibly can. I'm also not saying that. And also hear me say that you do need a rest because rest is a very important part of our humanity. You know, God has instituted the Sabbath so that we might rest. It's a stark reminder of our inherent limitations as humans. We need a rest. But folks, I, I don't think 
That is our problem here. Now, I don't think that's our problem. I think our problem is that we have leaned too far onto the side of self-protection and self-preservation. The fact that we want to place strict boundaries in ministry and in serving over what we can do, over what we can't do, and what we don't want to do, because we either assume we don't have the capacity to do it, or that we don't want to expose ourselves to failure, or that we don't want to have this deep sense of inadequacy, right? This whole idea of placing strict boundaries to protect ourselves, it actually hinders the conviction of self-sacrifice that is so needed in fruitful gospel ministry. Self-preservation dampens the conviction of self-sacrifice that is so needed in faithful and fruitful gospel ministry. The notion of self-preservation, it breeds complacency, right? You know what what self-preservation says? Self-preservation says, I will never try my hardest because I don't want others to see me fail. Self-preservation says, I will not accept the criticism that people have said of me because to work on my, my own weakness implies that I'm weak. And God forbid that people know that I'm weak. Right? Self-preservation says, I will not take any risks and I will not try anything new because by doing so, I'm doing something I'm not good at. And self, self-preservation also says, I will not have that hard conversation with that person because I don't want to get shot down. I don't want to get rejected. And self-preservation says that I will not give up my life for others, for my life is my very own. You see, the whole idea of self-preservation is that people can continue to serve God and continue to serve the kingdom without paying any considerable costs and without making any considerable sacrifices that could possibly put us in positions of weakness and vulnerability. But let's be real, right? How on earth can we possibly convince other people that Jesus is worth sacrificing for when we are not convinced of ourselves that he is worth sacrificing for? That if we insist on protecting ourselves so much from the burden, from, from the pain, and from the humiliation that comes from ministry, so much so that there's not a single crack on us, then how is the light of the glorious gospel in our clay jars supposed to shine brightly into the world for them to see the glory of God? Do you see? Self-preservation is crippling to our service to the Lord Jesus. And if that is you, if that is you, then you've got some serious thinking to do on whether you really do believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our Lord said, whoever wants to save their own life will lose it. You guys are familiar with that, right? But whoever loses their life for his sake will find it. That's what Jesus says. And you know, thank the Lord that, that many of you here in this room have found life in Jesus. And that many of you here are Christian. And you know what? Most, if not all of you, are Christian because someone has made a sacrifice for you. Because someone was willing to be uncomfortable. Because someone was willing to take that risk. If you really believe in the resurrection, you can be that someone for somebody else. You don't have to cling for dear life anymore. You are free from the bondage of self-protection. What we need is not self-preservation, folks. What we really need is sustainable sacrifice. Sustainable sacrifice. And that is actually absolutely possible because God in Christ has secured your future for you. It means we can take risks for the gospel. It means we can try something new. It means we can stay in ministries that are tough. It means we can have the courage to have tough pastoral conversations with people who do need to be rebuked and corrected. It means we can give our lives away for the sake of the gospel. It means we can make many mistakes and realize that God will use us well in our imperfections. Church, embrace the cracks on your broken vessels because the cracks in our vessel shows us the value of that which is carrying the gospel. We have no reason to lose heart because our weakness is not a liability in the service of the Lord. Right? That's what we've seen. Instead, it is an asset to be treasured. 
carrying the death of Christ in our bodies will exemplify the life of Jesus onto others. And we are actually able to do so because God in Christ has carried our death onto himself on the cross. And he has given us new resurrected life in him. He's made all of that possible. Life is found in this precious treasure that is stored in our jars of clay. Now what we've covered so far in our sermon is that God in his power uses us even in our imperfections. But we've also covered that God in his son has given us supernatural strength to serve self-sacrificially through the resurrection. But let's be real here. You know, the, the fact that God uses us in our weakness and the fact that God does give us new life in him, in one sense, this doesn't alleviate the pain that we go through, does it? It still hurts. And there's, this, there's still this lingering pain from the scars we bear in ministry. Some of us have been serving in ministry for long enough, and it's not far-fetched to say this, right, that, that often the burdens of ministry often chips away at our bodies. It's also a fair thing to perhaps say that ministry quickens our deaths, doesn't it? But don't lose heart, Paul says. Don't lose heart, because even though God uses us in our imperfections, even though God strengthens us by the power of his resurrection, he does infinitely more than that. Because he also renews us day by day until the day of his glorification, of our glorification. And so that's the final encouragement from Paul. Have a look with me in verses 16 to 18. 16 to 18. He says this, that though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul and his ministry companions remained resilient and they never gave up. Their bodies were wearing and tearing from the hush, beatings and the punishments and the stresses and the perplexities that they endured over the course of their ministry. You know, and, and, and such as that is the cost of a follower of Jesus. But you know, for Paul, he says that despite all that he's went through, he calls all of that light and momentary. How do you say that? Like, how is he able to say that? Verse 18 says it all. Have a look. Paul says that we are not to focus on what is seen, but focus on what is unseen. Focus on what is unseen, what is eternal. And folks, I think our minds, as we read this, I think our minds are too consumed by what's going on around us. I think our minds and our hearts are too entrenched in this present tangible reality. I think we're, we're, we're so concerned about what's going on around us right now, and we're so conditioned to think about our problems in this time-bound reality, that we see a lot of the issues that we're experiencing today in the present as being bigger than they really are. But in light of eternity, Paul says, these troubles are inconsequential. These troubles are inconsequential. Because nothing else that lives in this visible world is going to last. Nothing. Right? Not absolutely nothing. That the, the mean and horrible word that someone said to you, or you know, the the fact that you've put the wrong lyrics on the slides, or you know, you stumbled on your Bible reading, or you've preached a lazy a lousy sermon, or the fact that people don't respect you, or, or the fact that people don't appreciate you in your serving, you know, all these troubles are inconsequential. And and you know, all of these are just the smaller problems that we encounter in ministry. You know, most of us have not gone through what Paul had gone through. The guy was beaten up. He was battered. He was stoned. He was whipped multiple times. He often starved. And he faced danger from all four corners in the world, wherever he went. All the while, he was worrying constantly about the churches that he was serving in and being involved in. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And yet still, for him... He saw all of his afflictions and weaknesses as stepping stones of sanctification. That though outwardly he was wasting away, yet inwardly he was being renewed day by day by the grace of God. How much more should we see reality from eternity and actually recognize that God has actually accomplished something within us in those moments? 
that we should be more concerned about what God is preparing in us all, that he is growing us spiritually to be more like his son, and that all these afflictions are actually achieving for us an eternal glory. Now we've got to learn to see all of these things from God's perspective. That all these heavy troubles we're going through, they hurt right now, for sure, but God is doing something powerful. That all these moments of weakness and pain are renewing you day by day. And the Lord is preparing for you on the day that you get to receive the wonderful prize of eternal glory. We need to see things differently, and we will see things differently from the perspective of God. And you know, at the height of his career as a Pharisee, a, a career that he could have climbed even higher, Paul threw all of that away for a life of suffering and persecution. But Paul looked forward to the day of his final transformation at the coming, the second coming of Christ. For him, the weight of affliction is great, but the weight of eternal glory is even greater. The weight of affliction is great, but the weight of eternal glory is even greater. The glory we are to receive is far beyond our comparison, far beyond all comparison. And that's something we all should look forward to. And so how should we respond to the text in light of our passage? Right here are some things to ponder. You can have a look at your outline over there because the things to ponder there are kind of long. And so we're going to go through each of these. I'll talk about each of them. But here's the first one. What were some major encouragements that have come out of the passage that will help you to persevere in ministry through the challenges ahead? Uh, what are some major encouragements that will help you to persevere in ministry through the challenges ahead? The scriptures remind us to not lose heart. To not lose heart and not give up because God in his power uses us in our imperfections. And here's the second one, chew on this one. How do we typically view the place of our brokenness and fragility in our ministry? How do we typically view the place of our brokenness and fragility in our ministry? Like, do we view our weakness as a liability in the service of the Lord? Or do we view our weakness as an asset to be treasured? How does the scriptures today, for example, challenge us to see our weakness as being essential and necessary for the display of God's surpassing power? You know, how does the scriptures help us to embrace our calling as broken vessels who will radiate the light of the glory of the gospel? as we strive to display the life of Christ through our death to self, you know? Think about those questions. That's another thing to ponder. And here's the last one. In what ways can you treasure the reality of the resurrection in the way you serve God and others in ministry? In what ways can you treasure the reality of the resurrection in the way you serve God and others in ministry? We talked about the concept of self-preservation before. And I think it's fair to say that all of us here, to one degree or another, this affects us all in the way that we decide who we serve, where we serve, and how we serve. Now that Christ has actually given us new resurrection life in him, how could we be thinking about how we could live valiantly for his great gospel causes? Because the Lord Jesus has not called us onto a life of balance. He's called us onto a life of sustainable sacrifice onto him. And living a life of sustainable sacrifice is only made possible by the sacrifice he's made for us and through God's power at the resurrection. And so as I wrap up our time together, may we ask the Lord to help us focus on the path of eternal glory ahead. And this is a path that cannot be seen with the untrained eye, right? It's a path that only the Lord can take us. And so we're going to ask that he leads us and guide us by his powerful hand, giving us strength to persevere and endure in every difficulty we encounter in ministry. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for the message that we have received today. Lord, we thank you for the encouragements that you've given to us in this passage. As we think hard about the ministries that we're involved in, not just the ministries that we've been formally put in over others, but also the, the little ministries that we're doing um, over the course of our time in our lives, being figuring out how to express our faith in all contexts that we live in, whether it's in a workplace, whether it's in a home, whether it's at church. Lord, help us to think through all of these things. 
help us to reflect on the times we've been discouraged in ministry and help us to draw from the power of your resurrection and to help us to avoid falling into that mindset that, that we ought to protect ourselves from the pain that we go through in ministry. Because Lord, you give us the power to be able to do it all. So help us to persevere in serving you as we continue to live our lives in faithfulness to you. And so Father, we pray all of this in your son's precious name. Amen.